Hi, good afternoon, everyone. If I could have your attention, we'll start making um, progress with our session that leads into the keynote talk. Uh, it's my very great pleasure to be part of this conference. My name is Dr. Simon Amara, and I'm a colleague and friend of Hamid. Hamid um, deserves more than just rounds of applause for what he's achieved in bringing us all together in this conference. Uh, this has been amazing, the intellectual level of conversation that we've been having in the, as a result of having 30 minutes to become hedgehogs in each session is uh, really, really wonderful. And I know I can't, uh, I know, I, I can barely imagine just how hard Hamid has had to work to make all this happen. So again, Hamid, thank you for doing everything for all of us here. It's very, very much appreciated. Um, I, I have one announcement, and that is um, our, we, we were due to have two speakers for this session, and unfortunately one of the speakers had to pull out uh, for, for, because of an emergency. Therefore, our speaker this afternoon for this last session in session two is Dr. Charlotte Bank, who is uh, an acting professor at LMU in Munich. And her biography is available for you to read in the booklet. And following Hamid's instructions to chairs, I'm, I'm going to ask you please to look there so that uh, Charlotte can have as much time as she needs for her lecture and we can have as much time as we need for our questions. So, Charlotte, thank you very much indeed. And um, we look forward to your talk. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this uh, introduction and uh, I would also like to join everybody else in thanking Hamid for putting this wonderful conference together and also my thanks to all the entire organization. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and uh, to share uh, my research with you. I will talk about a particular aspect of contemporary artistic production in and from the MENA, Swana region that has steadily been gaining in importance for the past 20 or 25 years, and that is the articulation of diverse expressions of gender and sexuality. Contemporary artistic articulations of queerness do not operate in a historical vacuum, of course, but are embedded in a complex mesh of aesthetic traditions, global readings of modernity, local histories of modern art and activist practices. And it's this situation, situated position that forms the basis of my discussion today. I will focus on two contemporary artists and works spanning from the late 1990s till the present with a brief mentioning of three more artists. I will discuss the aesthetic choices and strategies of artists, their links with aesthetic and cultural traditions, as well as questions of visibility and reception. I will finish with some reflections on how artworks such as those discussed may function as subtle forms of activism. My focus is on the works of Shaza Sharafeddin from Lebanon and Feridun Av from Iran, and I will briefly mention Ebrin Baridi, uh, and Ali Reza Shojayan, also originally from Iran, as well as Anthony Hussein, a performance artist from Turkey. Their works examine forms of gender fluidity, homosociality, and same-sex relations, and offer a space to rethink the place of queerness in Middle Eastern and or Muslim societies and communities. These works coincide with an increase in scholarly works published over the past two decades that examine diverse sexualities and notions of gender in Middle Eastern or Islamic history, and in many cases have been inspirational for the practice of these artists. As I will discuss, certain visual tropes such as the garden, the zurkhana, the wrestling house, and the male adolescent, unbearded or with downy beards, serve as links between contemporary queer expression and aesthetic traditions of the region. Before I proceed, a few words about terminology might be in order. I'm discussing contemporary artworks that refer to or create links with pre-modern or early modern practices. The use of terms such as homosexuality, queerness, or even sexuality, all of them modern terms, might be somewhat problematic when used outside a modern context, and they use a subject to frequent scholarly debates. So while the artworks I'm going to discuss here 
might allow us to situate contemporary notions of diverse expressions of gender and sexuality in the historical texture of Muslim societies. As scholars, we should, uh, we should be cautious about speaking of pre-modern queerness or homosexuality without taking the firmly modern origin of these terms into account. Artists have a different kind of freedom to use these terms as they see fit, uh, of course. While keeping this in mind, I will now move forward to the topic of my talk. Let me first turn to examples of classical Islamic miniature painting that are of importance to my topic and then proceed to the temp contemporary works. In a painting by the Mughal painter Govardhan, we see two men standing opposite each other in a garden. They seem to be on intimate and friendly terms and the one who appears to be slightly younger throws flowers onto the feet of his older companion. The painting, Saadi in the Rose Garden, is the opening illustration of an edition of the 13th century Persian poet Saadi's Gulistan, Rose Garden, and depicts an incident in the life of the poet in which he recalls being persuaded by, a friend, by his friend and lover to spend a night in a garden in order to refresh his thoughts and regain his energy. As discussed by the art historian Mika Nativ, the image is filled with erotic connotations, the flowers thrown at the feet of the poet symbolizing the love act. Unlike the more common images of same-sex love in Islamic art involving a mature man and an adolescent boy, this image shows an amorous meeting between mature men as indicated by their beards. An example showing the more common subject of a mature man and an adolescent boy can be seen in the painting by, Musa, by Muhammad Qasim, portrait of Shah Abbas and his page, also set in a garden. And this is, of course, not the only example. The setting of the garden is of particular interest here. As discussed by the literary scholar, Ju scholar Julie Scott Misami, the garden as a symbol of love and the figure of the beloved is a common trope in literary traditions of the Islamic world and also in others. The garden is often described as a location for love and erotic encounters, what May Sami calls paradises of love. In Persian poetry, the body parts and the st stature of the beloved are often described as flowers, trees, and fruits in somewhat standardized ways. The figure of the beloved is thereby often of ambiguous gender. The descriptions used to depict beauty is largely the same for male and female beloveds, <laughs> described as being moon-faced, cypress-statured, narcissus-eyed, and having ruby lips, narrow waists, etc. In Persian, the personal pronouns is, pronoun is ungendered. In Arabic, by contrast, it is gendered, but literary conventions allow for the male pronoun to be used for both male and female objects of desire. So while a certain ambiguity may prevail in some cases, the gender of the beloved can often be gleaned from references to the circumstances of encounters, the occupation of the beloved, and other outer indica uh, indicators. As we can see in the example of Govardhan's and Kasim's paintings, the garden as a location of love and desire, whether between members of the same or the opposite sex, is also a trope found in classical Islamic miniature painting. For contemporary artists, garden and flower symbolism can serve as a way to connect to a traditional space of same-sex erotic encounters, as I will show through the works of the artists Shaza Sharafeddin and Feridun Ab. The photographic project, Divine Comedy, by the Lebanese visual artist Shaza Sharafeddin, consists of a series of 26 images that at first glance offer colorful imagery filled with joy and celebration. The images so shows portraits of women in flamboyant costumes embedded within collages of elements derived from classical Islamic miniatures. But this first impression is deceptive. In fact, the images are multi-layered and highly complex. 
Upon looking closer, it becomes clear that the gender of the models is ambiguous, and the Islamic imagery is drawn from multiple sources and belongs to different historical periods. With this project, Shaza Sharafuddin wanted to reflect on the historical changes of beauty ideals and representations of gender and ask what changing representational conventions mean for people in the present who do not easily fit into any rigid gender normative grid. In this way, the project might be termed an intertemporal reflection on gender representation in visual production of the wider Middle East and South Asia. At the center stands portraits of members of Beirut's small but diverse community of people with queer, fluid, and or ambiguous gender identities. Some of the pr protagonists are represented as mythological beings, such as Al-Burak, the human-headed winged creature that car carried Prophet, Prophet Muhammad on his journey through the heavens, as we see in this image, angels, um, or composite creatures of humans and animals, others as strong and proud female characters, such as the sultana, the young bride, or a fruit lady. Common to all images is that the models appear beautiful, elegant, refined, and proud. In a large part of these images, gardens and flowers play a major role as, fr as framing, settings, or background imagery, and help create an imaginative, festive environment outside of set notions of time and space. At the same time, the garden prov provides a link to, Islamic con to the Islamic concept of paradise, here most clearly, a place with an abundance of trees, flowers, and animals, and also a place where Rilman, designating young servants, attendants, or slaves, served wine that could be enjoyed without fear of tox intoxication. The Rilman were imagined as unbearded male adolescents who were common objects of love in pre-modern Islamic poetry. The paradise, thus conjured up by the multiple references of the images here, is a place where love, desire, and beauty, as well as wine, can be enjoyed free from rigid notions of gender and morality. The series in its entirety, with its fantastic creatures and otherworldly human figures who defy easy gender designations, seeks to, enjoy, to conjure up a utopic ideal setting. It does not create a historical link to a particular period and its connections to pre-modern Islamic culture is associative rather than historical and factual. Its aim is rather to create an alternative realm beyond historical and social realities within which to rethink gender and sexuality and maybe suggest a way out of rigid binary heteronormativity. Let me now turn to the second artist, Feridun Av. In collages and videos, Av explores notions of mas masculinity in Persian culture by referencing classical Persian literature or traditional lore. In a series of mixed media works that he pursued during, uh, through the 1990s and 2000s, he linked traditional Iranian wrestling with the pre-Islamic hero Rostam, a major protagonist of the 11th century Persian poet Ferdowsi's epic Shahnameh. Av refers to Rostam as the champion of champions, possibly as a play on the ancient notion of the king of kings, at the title used by an ancient Persian ruler of the Achaemenid uh, Empire and adopted by the Pahlavi dynasty in the 20th century. In these works, the figure of the contemporary wrestler becomes a, pro a location to problematize notions of masculinity and virility. So what he did in these, uh, in, in these uh, collages was to place images of contemporary wrestlers within a collage of different motives, mainly flowers and fruits. The images of the wrestlers are moved, removed from their original context and placed within the collages of other motives. In his series, Rustam in Late Summer, um, 
The, ro the flowers are mainly roses, but not only. Uh, fruit is also often a part of it. And according to the artist, the Rustam motif serves as a way to explore what he calls the mat macho mystic or the mystical side to chivalry in Iranian culture. For our, this mystical aspect of chivalry has positive connotations as opposed to the purely negative notion of machismo that he sees as prevalent in contemporary Iranian culture. Thereby, the hero Rustam serves as a prototype for a tradition of chivalry in Persian culture, a tradition that also incorporates poetry and especially love poetry. Here we may note a parallel to the European chivalry notion uh, where similar tropes appear. The abundance of roses also leads us to another aspect, namely the rose as a metaphor for the beloved and his her features, as, is, as it often appears in poetry. Another image of the series. In the context of Arv's images, the wrestler is a highly ambiguous figure. At first sight, he would seem to symbolize the very hyper-masculinity that the artist is so critical of. However, the cultural history of traditional Iranian wrestling is multi-layered and complex. Av uses the figure of the wrestler to reflect on the mystic, mystical side of the chivalrous, chivalrous ideals of masculinity. Chivalry was among the ideals held high by practitioners of traditional Iranian wrestling. Defined as an institution for men to exercise and develop body and mind, it was closely linked to the ideal of the Pahlavan, a champion athlete who was dedicated to fairness, selflessness, hospitality, generosity, and humility. The practice of traditional Iranian wrestling also open, opens up other interesting connotations. It was and is associated with a particular institution, the Zurkhane, House of Strength, uh, or wrestling house, and as pointed out by the historian Afsane Najmabadi and the art historian Christiane Gruber, its character as a space for homosocial gatherings also led to its reputation of being a location of homoerotic encounters. And as the historian and scholar of Iranian studies, Ho Chang Shehabi, has noted, homoerotic themes are frequent in classical Persian texts about traditional wrestling. So when Feridun Av is referring to the cultural space of traditional Iranian wrestling, he opens up a possibility to connect to a traditional space of alternative sexualities and remind viewers that in contrast to contemporary Iran, traditional culture allowed for or at least tolerated spaces for same-sex erotic encounters between men. This connection is stressed by the flowers as indicators of gardens, another historical space of same-sex love and erotic encounters. Feridun Av's series thus combines two sets of references to such spaces, the Zurkhane and the garden. We may also locate such notions in a video from 2009, Rustam's Dream, showing two rest wrestlers in a fight, one is trying to overthrow the other but the tempo is slowed down to an extreme slow motion and the video is set to the music of the aria Casta Diva from Vincenzo Bellini's no opera Norma. And the effect is, the effect of this slowing down together with this very uh, slow, uh, beautiful mu music is that the fight seems more like a dance and the two wrestlers bear more resemblance to lovers caught in an embrace rather than two fighters. If we consider the Rostam series with its, more, with its different connotations, two aspects stands out. As I just mentioned, they combine garden and flower imagery with the institution of tra traditional Iranian wrestlings. Both represented spaces with a history of homosociality and same-sex erotic encounters. Before I conclude, I would like to briefly mention three other artists in whose works we also find allusions to the garden, the zurkhane, and the third of the visual tropes I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, 
the unbearded or downy bearded male adolescent. The series of drawings, Eastern Desires, by the Iranian-Canadian artist Ebrin Bareri, shows young men and male adolescent, or even sometimes boys, some with beards, but most of, most of them beardless or with downy beard, the downy cheeks, which is a common expression in poetry celebrating these youths, beauty and charm. These images are replete with subtle allusions to historical homosocial spheres, such as the garden and the zurkhane. For instance, some images show roosters held by or associate, associated with the boys, in some cases men, um, that may be a reference to cockfighting and betting, which were historically common pastimes of some regulars of the Zurkhane, so-called Lutis. These were a marginal group of men of questionable reputation, who besides organizing cockfights, uh, also were known to drink, gamble, fight with knives, and being sexually deviant. The unbearded male adolescent is also a recurring feature in Anthony Hussein's performance project, Project O, the O referring to the non-gendered pronoun, weaving together memories of his childhood in the city of Urfa and his realization of his own difference compared to other boys with recollections of his excitement when discovering the singer and performer Zeki Muren, here, whose queerness was an open secret and who has since his death become a queer icon. Anthony Hussein reflects on the role of homosocial traditions uh, in the region of his birth and how these enabled a gray zone between companionship among men and homoeroticism. In the, in the performance, the object of admiration from a well-known traditional song, sung, often sung in musical gatherings of men, Ömer, is played by another, or enacted by another performance artist, Michaela Dawood, who with their delicate features and movements seem to embody the ideal dancing boys of poetry and art. The theme of, um, okay, so let me just move on. Yeah, another example of uh, Zeki Muren as a queer icon, which is also part of uh, Anthony Hussein's performance, is a work um, by another performance and visual artist, Giange Gümüş Türkmen, Murenka, where he references and offers his um, homage to the, to the performer by Rep reproducing one of his iconic uh, stage boots. So the theme of historical same-sex relations between men in Western Asia and contemporary queer, su queer subjectivities is central to the work of another Iranian artist, Ali Reza Shujayan, who often combines contemporary portraiture with paintings in the tra Persian tradition. Thereby, he draws on the rich tradition of Persian legends replete with fantastic and, gen and gender ambiguous creatures to create images, Im uh, to create imaginary spaces of fluid expressions of gender and sexuality, while also offering a critique of current ideals of masculinity as they are dominant in Iran. In this critique, his work parallels that of Feridun Av and other Iranian artists. And he also refers to the figure of Rustam. However, for Shujayan, he is not a role model, but rather the false hero that needs to be overcome. In an interview, the artist stressed with a smile that he doesn't want him killed, just subdued. And in the epic, and as in the epic, the demons are useful for this overcoming. So for Shujayan, demons are not inherently evil beings, but rather allies in overcoming patriarchy and heteronormativity. So, except for Ali Reza Shujayan and Anthony Hussein, the artists discussed here do not see themselves as activists for queer rights. All artists move within the circuit 
of global art of the global art world. They exhibit at biennales, large curated exhibitions, and gallery spaces, and their works are found in private and public collections. And yet their work retain an activist stance in the sense that they represent a reality that is often sidelined or even criminalized in their countries of origin. For practitioners of, and theorists of critical and socially engaged art, art is seen as a powerful tool to articulate social and political concerns and to advocate for change in the status quo. In the words of the artist and theorist Dennis Wong, to imagine that, I quote, a world with different social arrangements, behaviors, or both is possible, end of quote. In a climate where social conservatism might place restrictions on outward activism for queer rights, artworks that make use of ephemeral ways to refer to spaces of diverse gender identities, sexualities, and same-sex practices, as discussed here, may offer a way out of this dilemma. The historical dimension of the works allows us to situate contemporary queer identities within the cultural fabric of the region and of Muslim society, rather than as foreign Western imports, as is often the case in mainstream debates and media in the region. The artworks ask if Middle Eastern or Islamic history has witnessed different notions of gender than those considered the norm in the present with its stress on heteronormativity. They thus allow to reconnect, to, to reconnect contemporary gender and, social, and sexual diversity with Middle Eastern and Islamic cultural heritage and thereby counter the notion that these con constitute imported phenomena. For artists in the diaspora, this becomes pertinent as they face complex hostilities from Islamophobic and homophobic elements of their hosting societies and possibly homophobia from conservative elements of their communities where LGBTQ plus activism is frequently decried as foreign to Islamic and or Middle Eastern culture. By developing a cross-temporal dialogue between contemporary and pre- and early modern artistic and cultural production, these artists and their works help create what the gender theorist Caroline Dinshaw and Gayatri Gopinath has referred to as communities across time and new ways of imagining collectivity, respectively. With their work, the artists allow to reimagine contemporary queer subjectivities as belonging to Islamic culture and Muslim society. Recovering this forgotten history was at the center of the exhibition, The Third Muslim, Queer and Trans-Muslim Narratives of Resistance and Resilience staged in 2018 at the Somat Cultural Center in San Francisco. In the words of Yas Ahmed, the curator of the exhibition, I quote, we've always been here and we're just claiming our rightful place within Islam, end of quote. So with this quote, I would like to thank you for your attention. Charlotte, thank you very much. That was a magnificent presentation on such an important and timely topic. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions, um, so I won't hog the microphone, but come... Could we point out some questions? Yes, please. Whilst, Audrey, are you on the microphone? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. I wanted to ask you um, whether you would consider also um, more contemporary popular practices um, as being a connection between some of these artists, or whether that's been considered um, as, as a way to measure um, the, the queer within Islamic society. In specific, I'm referring to two um, different kinds of ritualistic things. One has to do with the uh, Shia um, Ashura, Muharram, particularly in Iran and Iraq, where there's a lot of um, display of bravado, of, of male nudity of, of ma many things that are very much you know accepted as part of the practice but also in terms of all of the posters related to 
Islamic figures where imagery is forbidden, but it in particular comes to my mind the very sexy images that are produced of Imam Hussein. Um, so I just wonder where this fits into your um, narrative. Thank you. Thank you very much for this question. Actually, um, it's one thing, especially the posters of these very beautiful Imam Ali and Imam Hussein, uh, is something very much um, that, that I would actually very much like to look into. I haven't, I haven't done it so far, but thanks a lot for bringing it up, bringing it up here. Um, they do have a very queer aesthetic, you might say. And um, in some artworks, um, which I haven't been discussing here, but in some artworks, this kind of aesthetic is also referenced. So it is actually something that is worth looking into. Um, it's, I, I haven't done it so far, but it might be something I would consider, yes. <laughs> Thank you. The, the woman at the back, if you can pass it. If, shall, Audrey, can you run and scuttle over? Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was very um, insightful and thought-provoking. Uh, I'm curious to know if you found that in your examination of um, uh, homosexuality within traditional Iranian literature and art, um, how these works might be informing or guiding uh, the cause of feminism in modern day Iran. Um, I have to say that I'm not a scholar of Iranian literature or, or uh, poetry. I'm an art historian. My specialization is in contemporary global art. Um, when thinking about the recent feminist movement in, in Iran and also the way it resonated with, uh, with contemporary Iranian artists living in the diaspora, the, the subject of queerness comes up every uh, comes up often um, it's um, I, I don't really think I can go so much into the question of, of uh, the connection between um, Iranian feminism and and my subject because it's a little bit outside of my research thank you Question from well, the question perhaps closer to you, Audra. Oh, just over there, gentlemen, just over there, and we'll come to Bruce. About seven. Hi, Charlotte Smalu. Hi. Uh, seven years ago, I was part of a group uh, that was led by a queer translator, and the group had planned to uh, put together a uh, anthology of queer writing from the region. And it was a series of meetings, and for whatever, whatever reason, this anthology did not come to fruition. And I met the translator recently, and, and uh, we were discussing uh, the anthology. And the translator told me that if they were going to do the, tr the anthology today, the translator and none of the writers that I'd met in the group that we were meeting regularly in would put their name on the uh, anthology because things have become so difficult in, 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 in the countries for uh, queer writers, and so no one is public. So what I'm curious about is about the contemporary production of uh, by queer artists in the region. Are they using more metaphor? Are they being more underground because it's become more dangerous? Thank you, Malou, for bringing this up. Yeah, in, indeed, things have gone backwards in many ways. Um, there was a moment of hope where people were thinking that, uh, at least in some countries, that things were moving forward uh, and it would become easier to be more open uh, about uh, queer subjectivities, even if not all uh, artists want or were willing to be out. I have to say that among, from the artists that I'm discussing, it's not, uh, not all of them are um, open about their, their sexuality. Uh, and it's something that is, of course, very important to also to respect. 
um, others don't speak about it, don't make it part of their public personas. For instance, Feridun Av is more of an open secret that he's gay, but he's not open about it. He leaves it vague, but everybody is always mentioning it. So this is also why I'm mentioning it here, but it's not part of his work. Um, Ali Reza Shujayan is very clearly out as a gay artist, and um, but had to leave Iran and is is now living in France. And it was, and he left Iran via Beirut. And in Beirut, he decided to come out and and bring his his uh, also his his gay artistic production that he had already worked on in in Iran to really bring it out and sh and to to show it in exhibitions for many artists it's a very it's a complicated um balancing act of deciding when to talk about what and um Unfortunately, I haven't uh, been able to do this research in Iran because the, the, the woman life freedom movement um, came in the way uh, and, and before, before that the pandemic came in the way and, and um, it was impossible for me to travel. And then afterwards, the security situation uh, was uh, deteriorated. So I am having these discussions about the situation in Iran via lots of different channels, and most of them are in the diaspora. So this is, of course, limiting, but it's part of a research. This is part of the research project also. We always have to deal with certain limit limitations. Now the limitation <coughs> is in, in uh, doing research in Lebanon, which is now uh, being bombed. And um, so, in Lebanon, for instance, the situation was quite hopeful a um, few years ago in, from, let's say, 2016, 17, 18. There was a lot of queer production and, and many artists decided to, um, to show their work and uh, that situation has also deteriorated. So it's something, it's a very fluctuating situation. And it's changing all the time, which makes it difficult, yeah. A question from Joyce. Uh, thank you. Very, very interesting. Uh, two, uh, two elements. Um, one, uh, in um, the, the, the image of the garden uh, is used also in the heterosexual literature, uh, mainly in Nafzawi, Ibn Hazm, yeah. etc., etc., um, I just wondered uh, how you introduce this in the the landscape in uh, in your thought. Um, and the uh, second one um, is that um, when I saw uh, the the uh, Shaza Sharaf Din work on Divine Comedy, it resembles a lot the work of a, a Moroccan uh, artist uh, Abbas Saladi. Who was who was uh, drawing from uh, Farid Din uh, uh conference of birds and the, the just uh, parallels mm. that could be made. Uh, they may, maybe they are just comments. But please. Thank you. Yes, um, of course, the garden. Uh, I also mentioned it that it's a it's a location for love and and erotic encounter. I mean, my, I don't think that uh, so many new things need to be added to, to the discussion of the garden as a, as a space for heterosexual encounter. Uh, I want to widen it up and widen it, broaden it, and to include the homosexual encounter, the... Uh, because that is what has been written out of history. Also, the the homo so, the, the homoerotic poetry has been written out of uh, of, of uh, literary history, and so it's a it's a project about bringing these issues back into the history, the, into art history, and into uh, literary history. While I have to say this is not my 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 main my main focus, but I. I want to bring it back into cultural and aesthetic history. Um, 
Interesting to know about this, uh, this Moroccan um, artist. Uh, could I have his name again? Yeah, he's a late artist, Abbas Saladi. Abbas? Abbas Saladi. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'll look him up. Are there any more questions? Yes, uh, Sarah at the front. Audra, you any? Yeah, we've got someone else coming closer to you than Audra. There we are. Professor Wilson there. Um, thank you so very much for that. And I just wondered if, um, going back to somebody like André Gide at the turn of the century in France, who had all his homoerotic encounters in North Africa, uh, and, but then was widely illustrated with his book Fruits of the Earth, Les Nourritures Terrestres, if there's not only that also possibly colonial dimension to the depiction of homosexual love in these, in these areas. Um, as you might have noticed, I mean, I'm speaking about artists from the region and the way they are trying to, to re, recover and, and to re, uh, reframe these issues. So um, the colonial aspect in, in the sense of European artists um, producing works of... Um, photographs and um, paintings of, of beautiful young men and boys isn't really part of my project because it's, uh, I'm looking at the, at the artists from the region. Um, it's an, of course, you might always, I mean, images circulate, of course, and the way that artists uh, from Iran, from Lebanon, from, uh, from North Africa, from Egypt, the way they, they develop their motives, of course, might be influenced, uh, whether consciously or unconsciously, uh, through simply from the, the, the experience of, of, image, of, of seeing images, uh, might be the case in some, in some cases, uh, not necessarily the artists that I'm working with. And it's not necessarily part of my of my research. Thank you, uh, Katya. You certainly allowed a question. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Charlotte. Just one question: uh, What is is there a reason that you haven't included any women artists who address this, such as Laurence Rasti, the Swiss Iranian um, um, artist, and her series "There Are No Homosexuals in Iran." Well, I am showing one one uh, woman artist, Shaza Sharafuddin, as oh, yeah. a woman. No, apart apart from that, like um, other otherwise, I mean, Sorry. it's um, I, I I am in, I mean, uh, th this is of course part of a of a larger research project, and I am also including other women artists. Uh, I wanted here to talk about these uh, the, the the visual tropes that uh, that come up. Uh, on a regular basis in, in the works of these artists. And this is a selection of, of the artists that I'm, that I'm working with. Okay, so do you, do you cover L Laurence as well in, in the work on, on, you don't find it that relevant? I, I, I don't really find it that relevant, but okay. I'll, I can always try to look her up again. So okay. thank no, no, you. No, I was for, interested yeah. in, thank you. <laughs> Great. I think then with that, we'll wrap this session up. It's a wonderful, wonderful thought and provocative talk. Thank you so much, Charlotte, for introducing me. Um, Hamid, what time do you want everyone back? Can we all come back then for 10 past four? There's coffee outside, I believe. Thank you very much, everyone.